So welcome back to London. For most of you who've been away, and Happy New Year. I'm guessing that for many of you it was wonderful to go home and see your family after a few months away, and then it was wonderful to leave home two weeks later and unsee your family at the end, and rediscover your adult independence again. Home cooking is great, but it's very nice to have a bacon double cheeseburger meal with a McFlurry on the side, isn't it? Just for a change. It's been very quiet here over the Christmas break at the chaplaincy. We had a wonderful um, lunch with 23 people for our Chinese banquet on Christmas Day. Don't ask me why it was Chinese, that's just our tradition here. We set up the crib. Come and have a look. It's the last day, so after Mass, come and have a look at the crib in the corner. In addition, this year, my little nephew gave me a bronze reindeer for Christmas. So we put this between the camel and the sheep, um, <laughs> worshipping the Lord Jesus. The wise men have been moving slowly across the chapel, making their way from the east. A few people went to Youth 2000, to the retreat at New Year. A little bunch went to the fireworks, and that's the sum total of the activity here over the break. Last Sunday, as you know, I wasn't here, you were, the wise men finally arrived in time for the Feast of the Epiphany, and today we're celebrating the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, so it feels quite natural. We're jumping pretty quickly, but we're jumping very naturally from the birth of Jesus, Christmas, the Epiphany, to the beginning of his public ministry, represented by his baptism in the River Jordan. So there's a shift, a change. But notice something very interesting. Christmas tide, that lovely phrase, Christmas tide, the official season of Christmas, it doesn't finish actually until tonight. Aha! So Christmas doesn't end until the baptism ends. So this feast, the baptism of Jesus, is actually part of Christmas, not just the time after Christmas. And that should make us think. John the Baptist is baptising people in the River Jordan with a baptism of repentance to help them confess their sins and be converted to a new way of life, a new holiness. Does Jesus need this? Of course not. He's the Saviour, the Holy One. He's completely without sin. But he chooses to step into the same waters as sinners. He wants to be with us in our reality, in the chaos and darkness that the waters symbolise, to be with sinful humanity, even though he himself is without sin. Do you see the connection with Christmas now? Christmas is about the incarnation, when the eternal word of God took flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He became one with us through his human nature and was born into our world at Bethlehem. But there was still the possibility, theoretically, that Jesus could have shielded himself from the full consequences of the Incarnation. He could have stayed within the warm, loving embrace of his family in Nazareth for the rest of his life. He could have protected himself from harm and from the full reality of this broken, fallen world. Like when you see someone wearing a mask on the London Underground, so they don't have to breathe in the fumes of the trains and the diseases of those around them. I'm not judging these people, I can understand it, yeah? Protecting oneself from one's environment. But the waters of the River Jordan are a symbol of the willingness of Jesus to be one with us completely. He's willing to use a famous phrase from the early church. He's willing to share not just our nature, but our condition. Memorise that if you can. Jesus came to share our condition, 
and not just our nature. So there's nothing apart from sin that he has not embraced. There's no human experience, however dark or difficult, that he doesn't understand from the inside. Whatever you are going through, right now, he's going through it with you. He's been there in the River Jordan and the Spirit wants to come upon you to transform your life just as it came upon Jesus to transform his humanity while he was still in the river. That's the point. The Spirit comes upon this man, Jesus, our Saviour, while he's in the river of our chaos and darkness and sin, but without sin himself. Let me put it in one sentence. When Jesus is baptised, he becomes completely one with us. And when we are baptised, we become completely one with him. It's that simple. I was baptised, like many of you, as a baby. It was in my Anglican parish of St Michael and All Angels in West London in Chiswick. I went to visit this church a few years ago because the train broke down at Turnham Green and I, I took this as a sign from God to go and visit this church. <laughs> and I found it was open and I found the font at the back of the church, the baptismal font, a stone basin of water about three feet wide with one of these huge wooden lids hanging from the ceiling. This is a, a medieval English tradition. It was strange to think that my Christian life began here in this stone font all those years ago. But in our local church now, I mean us here in Gower Street at the Chaplaincy, our local official parish church, I hope you've been to it, is St Charles Borromeo. Am I pointing in the right direction? Yes. St Charles Borromeo, just two minutes the other side of Tottenham Court Road. And the baptismal pool there is very different. It's built into the floor. If you are baptised as an adult, you step into the pool. I think it is seven symbolic steps. It's deep enough to cover you, the water. So you are completely immersed in the waters of baptism. And then you step out the other side, very symbolic, walking up the, the exit steps, as it were, to enter into the main body of the church. Go and see it if you haven't. So the symbolism at our parish church is much more powerful than a little bowl of water, which is what most of us were baptised in. This font is like a spiritual bath that washes and cleanses you. It's like a sea as if you're drowning in the waters and then lifted out to safety. It's like a tomb that traps you in the darkness of death before you rise with Jesus Christ in his resurrection. It's like a womb from which you are born into the new life of faith. Your life will never be the same again. Why do Christians get baptised? Isn't it enough just to believe in Jesus Christ? This is what some Christians believe. Yeah. All you need is faith. Well, faith matters, absolutely. But Jesus himself is very clear about the importance of baptism for us and not just for him. At the end of St Mark's Gospel, Jesus says, Anyone who believes and is baptised will be saved. The words of Jesus. Baptism is the gateway to salvation. This is why at the end of St Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, us, to baptise people of every nation. Baptism unites you with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within your soul and you become a beloved child of God the Father. Your sins are completely forgiven and the burden of original sin is lifted from your shoulders. You are given personally 
the gifts of faith, hope and charity. You become a member of the church, the body of Christ. You share in his priesthood. You're anointed. Did you know this? Praying in his name, serving others, sharing your faith with others, teaching in whatever capacity is right for you. Baptism is like a seal that is burnt into your being. You have an identity which can never ever be taken away. What's not to like? Really. Let me do one or two baptism factoids with you to help you when you're at your next pub quiz for Catholics. And really, you should know these things anyway. And I'm going to test you over cake. Right? Who can be baptised? I'm not going to get your hands up now, but just a quick pause. Who can be baptised? See if you know the answer. Anyone who hasn't been baptised before, obvious, who believes in Jesus Christ and in the apostolic faith, who has repented of their sins and is trying to live the Christian life. So baptism involves faith, repentance and conversion. This little baby here crying out for baptism now. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, we'll get there, France, we'll get there. It can include, the little one here, children who are brought to baptism on the basis of the faith of their parents and of the wider church. So that's who. Next question. Who can do the baptising? Who can baptise? The minister. Well, in the Catholic tradition, it's usually a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. But, in an emergency situation, if you're on a ship that is sinking and someone asks you to be baptised, if a baby is mortally sick in a hospital and you're the only one there, in an emergency situation, anyone can baptise, including you. Again, I hope you knew that. How do you baptise? Well, look, you've just got to know this, and I hope you do. You immerse the person three times in water, or you pour water three times over their head, as you say the words, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Easy. And the last question, there's lots of others, but the last little factoid, what about those who have not been baptised? Well, we can be certain that God is working in ways unknown to us and we must never judge the hearts of those who've not been baptised or the situation they're in. But, as we've heard, baptism is such an incredible gift and we know that Jesus longs to share it with everyone. So as Christians, of course, we long for all people to discover it. So sadly we don't have a pool built into our floor here. But as you know, at Newman House every year we build a huge baptismal pool here at the side of the sanctuary in our church every Easter. And we will do the same this April. In my first year here, in what was Easter 2014, we had a wooden frame, large sheets of plastic and many miles of parcel tape and we managed to make a beautiful baptismal font that looked just like a 5th century Roman marble baptismal font. It was a beautiful service and the baptisms took place here without any problems. But when I went back into the chapel here after the party the whole chapel had flooded. <laughs> you can see the stains still here, five years later. The pool had sprung a leak. There was water everywhere. Everything was ruined. And at half past midnight that night, as I came here after three glasses of Prosecco, I just felt like weeping. But then after a moment, just a few seconds recollecting myself, I actually laughed 
I felt this was like another baptismal symbol. Grace gets everywhere. We're not in control. The Holy Spirit fills the hearts of the newly baptised and then spreads over the whole church, going where he wants, touching everything, going beyond our tidy plans, certainly beyond my tidy plans. That's the meaning of grace. So maybe God was saying something through that flood. Let's finish with some dates. I told you when I was baptised. Sorry, I told you where I was baptised in Chiswick, West London. But let me tell you the date too. The 1st of January. Yeah, it's a nice easy date to remember for me. I was baptised the 1st of January. It's in my diary. And I keep it as a special day every year, as important as my birthday. This is when my life of faith truly began. This is when Christ united my life with his and brought me to share through the Holy Spirit in the life of the Most Holy Trinity. Shouldn't I celebrate this? So, do you know when and where you were baptised? Okay, I said we wouldn't do hands. Hands up who knows when and what date they were baptised on. Hands up high. Right, 10% of you, 90% of you don't know when you were baptised. It's shocking, right? If you don't, the 90% find out and come and tell me next week and you will not be allowed into Mass unless you give me the date. <laughs> yeah? You owe it to yourself to know. You owe it to God to know in order to give him the thanks he deserves. And please, with my permission, treat this day as a great celebration each year, on the level as your birthday or wedding anniversary or whatever. Tell your friends, buy a cake, have a beer, take the day off work. Yeah, the day of your baptism. But we also owe it to others to celebrate this day so that we can share our joy with them and witness to our faith. Remember the parable of the lost coin. When the woman finally finds the coin she has been searching for, quote, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. That's the normal human response to discovering a great gift, to tell others and to celebrate with them. How much more this is true of our baptism.